Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, the die is cast. You have to start off with a date. My date is 1987 when I joined Foster and Partners and met Bill for the very first time, working on the King's Cross Master Plan, the original low-level station for what was to become High Speed One and the 54 hectares of development there that was all about how did you create a new form of city. It was all about, with the conversations with the bill, about how did you integrate large development into the surrounding fabric? How did you recognise the barriers to movement and how did you break those down? How did you connect from King's Cross back um, to Camden? How did you cross um, St Pancras railway lines? It was all about connectivity. And I think that's really infused itself into so many of the projects that we've worked on. <coughs> Another thing that King's Cross, I suppose, retrospectively taught us, and 87 was around the time when London stopped shrinking. During the war, there was a mass exodus of people joining the services, uh, leaving London for safety reasons. They returned in part, but it was a birth of the, um, the Garden City, the new cities, the new development movement. And it took us about a decade to start building, delivering those new homes, and people started leaving London. So for a period, people started vacating the city, and we emptied the city. We had space. And sometime in the, the 80s or late 80s, we started to return because we filled up those new cities, and we returned to London. And we've not noticed those people coming back because there was space to accommodate them. What really strikes us when we look at the statistics for, for growth in the UK, um, population growth, it's not the 20% population growth that London faces, the 2,000 extra people in London every eight days. It's not the demand for 45, 50,000 new homes a year for the next 20 years, depending whose figures you use. It's the gem demographics. It's the change in terms of the way people are living in fact, we're living longer. We've got the fastest rising birth rate since the 1950s. And it's going to drive our urban form in very particular ways. Which is why when we started thinking um, about how people will move and where people will locate, we started thinking about what is the nature of movement from the periphery to the centre. There is only so much space in the centre that we can develop. All of the new homes are going to be around the periphery. How will we move into the centre of, um, of employment in the city? So that led to the conversations from our part, Sam, who'd already started on this journey. And it was thinking about what is the nature of moving from the periphery into the centre? How will we get arterial <coughs> movement in the future? How will different demographics impact on our movement systems, our movement patterns? And how do we get more capacity from the systems we've got? We're not going to build new roads. How, how, how are we going to move in the future? And what are the, the key challenges we've got? Well, we're seeing the challenge, the debate about the integration of cycling into that congested highway. We're seeing people making that personal choice about how they want to move. But that's where the conflict is. We don't have the space to accommodate them. Something has to give. Somebody has to move out of the way. Well, that's a particular issue in the centre that we will deal with in terms of safer streets, all the work that's going on now. And this is not about taking the emphasis off making the, the streets safer, particularly in the centre. This is about creating arterial movement, how you can cycle without stopping, without stopping at a red light, you know, all that energy you put in only to break and stop again. This is about having freedom to move unhindered over relatively long distances. It's about creating new arterial capacity the sort of capacity that we can only create through something like Crossrail, Crossrail 2, um, Waterloo Barking Line, Thameslink. How can we create something that finds new arterial capacity? And is there actually something that we've ignored? Um, the Victorians building the railways, the steam train, with very low power, having to follow the contours at a steady gradient, perfect for cycling. But we turned our back on it because it was smoky, it was noisy, it was dirty. We didn't want to be associated with it. Is there actually something there that we could repurpose, keep the trains, but look at that arterial route through the city, build on top of it, create a lightweight deck, use the sort of technology that we would use to create an underground tunnel boring machine and create an overground platform laying machine. It's giving arterial capacity. Yes, it's the same sort of cost and investment, but it's a different sort of city. It's a city where you can create new high streets that link communities that unlock 
development opportunities alongside. Where are we going to put the new homes? Where are the new jobs going? The new types of jobs? Where are the new health facilities, the schools? Well, maybe this is actually quite a good way of thinking about it. New arterial connections that link existing communities that are clustered around the railway lines, the stations, but in a completely different pattern. So there's a good starting point. Now think about populating all of those vacant sites adjacent to the railway line that are low value with high value opportunities, high value buildings where people will want to live, people will want to work, people will want to go to school. And that's very much an approach uh, that we've taken uh, in terms of how cycling can be integrated in a different form of compact city. Thank you, Hugh. Um, so just to, just to pick up from, from this image, the, the way in which, oh, sorry, I'm Sam Martin, and Hugh and I have been working together on this for a couple of years with Ollie, my colleague, and Space and Tax for the last six months. Uh, what, 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 what I see with this, with this image here, to me, is akin to a, a river, a railway line, in essence, everything backs onto, and without a crossing and without a connection across it, it is like a river without a bridge. So what we're proposing is that the, the conduit by which people can get around could be linked in to either side of the railway line, which is what Hugh touched on. And the, the capacity issue is an incredibly important part, I believe, of the future of London. The more and more people that are going to be needing to travel into the middle, as you can see, that skyline is going to change significantly over the next 25 years. People aren't going to be living within 15 minute walk of those buildings. They're going to be living, in some cases, 15 miles away. So how are people going to get into the city who can't afford necessarily to pay two, three thousand pounds for a travel pass? How about getting around on a bicycle in a more egalitarian manner? So to us, it's all about creating a slightly more egalitarian approach to the future of the city. Um, next. So just, just looking at the reality of the, of the, the six zones for, for central London, the, if you live outside of those zones, it's quite a, a lot more expensive and quite a, uh, a sort of problematic journey if you, if you choose to use public transport or, or, or not. And if you choose to use a bike, it's even more difficult. Anna will show you some, some maps and some times that will get you into the centre. Uh, but the reality is that people are going to be working more and more in the middle and more than likely living further and further out from the middle. And it's how you get people in in a, in a way that everyone can afford to do so. This perhaps was a vision of the Oyster Card when it first came out. What we would like to see next is that by virtue of the cycle and by virtue of being able to get away around in your own energy, in your own time, you are not necessarily going to have to be paying for it, but you're going to be able to actually benefit yourself and benefit the city and benefit, I guess, the future for the city. The opportunity that we were first given by Network Rail when we first took the idea to Network Rail was from Stratford to Liverpool Street. And I just wanted to, to finish on this slide here. We're looking from Newham, if you like, into the middle of the city. Newham is looking to grow significantly in terms, in this area, about 20,000 homes over the next 20 years. And at the end of this line near Liverpool Street, there's a, a thing called Tech City, which is maybe taking a hold or maybe not, in the Old Street roundabout. And it's the cities of the world who are attracting the young people that are going into the tech hubs around the world. They're more than likely attracting, I think, people who would like to be able to get around in their own means rather than have to rely on public transport. What I think would be a great way for the future is for a low-tech thing like a bicycle to be able to get you the six kilometres into Old Street in 15 minutes without spending any unnecessary money on anything and getting your view of London, getting some fresh air and then going in and con contributing to the tech city that Old Street could become. So it's about the combination of low-tech and high-tech and to me it's about bridging the divide that the railway lines have perhaps given us and in some cases divided some parts of London but it's a massive opportunity for reconnecting people to the city. So that's pretty much all I needed to say. Thank you.